I am starting a uh, study in James. Um, James is a fascinating book. It's, um, it's a controversial book. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, James, there was some discussion, considerable discussion, um, about whether James should even be in the canon of Scripture, but it, it, that's been settled a long time ago and it was determined it was absolutely anointed and uh, spirit-filled and part of the canon of Scripture. And um, you know that's true when both Catholicism and all the Protestant and Orthodox churches agree that James is a book of the Bible. Um, but the other part about why it was so much a problem is that James seems to almost go against like Hebrews or Paul. For we know this, that by grace we're saved through faith and not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works. And so the whole of Paul's letters in the New Testament are, hey guys, there's nothing you can do to get to heaven. It's the blood of Christ. It's faith by grace. You have to say yes and accept that gift. But by the same token, James comes along and says, um, hey guys, if you've got faith, that's more than lip service. It, that's more than just the I believe. In fact, James will write things in this book like the devil believes and he trembles. So what we've got is a whole lot of lip service believers with lives that are changed and do not show a living faith. And James comes along and he really gets tough on us. But it's, it's not meant to be the book of doing, but that's what it looks like. And it is. But it's not meant to be doing to get to heaven. He's saying there is an evidence in your life if you have literally placed your faith in Christ and Christ is in you, then something's going to come out of you that looks like Christ. And so there is, there are behavioral changes in the person that comes to Christ. Now, the fine line and the difficulty is that we know there are diff people are at different levels at different time in their walk with Christ. <clears throat> so some may be really struggling and falling down a lot, slipping and falling, and we just talk about like immaturity. Uh, Paul calls them milk Christians. You know what it's like for a toddler. And they're learning to walk, and when they fall down, you don't go, shame on you. You go, hey, if they take two steps, you go, yippee. I mean, guys, I have seen some really strange things with kid raising. <laughs> I mean, I see a crowd stand around the toilet and go, oh, oh wow, okay. Well, sometimes it feels like that in church. Sometimes it feels like we're applauding somebody's mess. But you know what we're doing? There's a difference in immaturity and needing to grow up. I've told you before, you can take a two-year-old to the doctor, and the doctor says, that's a perfect two-year-old. I tell you that kid. If that kid is acting like that at 16, we've got a problem. Right? So there's, God knows where each person is at. But there's a difference in immaturity and dead faith. And James is the advocate of a living faith. So it's one thing to say, well, I came to Christ. Yes, but as Christ come into you. And that's what James is saying. Have you surrendered? Does your life show? So Hebrews 11 is all about faith. And, it, and he, the writer of Hebrews talks about how Abraham by faith offered up Isaac and Rahab by faith, you know, lowered the men and on and on. And James comes back and says, yeah, but I've got to tell you something, guys. It sounds like an argument, but he's going, but i got to tell you something. There, was, there were works. Could I call it a response? He said there were works in that. Abraham didn't just believe God. He offered up Isaac. There is something that comes out of your life. 
And the reason I'm going into this book is I think it's actually a book that is a book of preparation for where we're going as a people. We, we are nearing, I don't care if it's 50 years away, we are nearing a time when I believe God is going to say, son, it's time. I mean, we are nearing the return of Christ. And, and I won't predict that because Jesus said he didn't even know. But he said, of the times and the seasons, don't be ignorant. You can look at a red sky and you can say there'll be fair weather. And he says, and you know, we, we use that old thing, you know, red sky in the morning, sailors morning. And he says, you know how to read things as simple as the weather. So be aware of the signs of the times, and I've never seen signs like this before. Never did I dream in my lifetime I would see an absolute antichrist spirit in every realm coming against the family and coming against the church and coming against our nation. It's unbelievable. I, ca I cannot. I thought I would pass away first, but I'm glad I didn't. Because what I want to do today is say, we got to get prepared. I want to, oh yeah, I know what you would really like. I'm sorry, go home and watch Joel Osteen if you want to have a really good time. All right, go back and watch your best life now. But I want to tell you, your best life is coming one of these days. And your best life is one that is ready to face any kind of trial and persecution and trouble and stand tall in the middle of it. So James, now let me get some other controversy aside. First of all, James was probably written about 45 to 48 AD. It is believed to be the first book of the New Testament actually written. And the Jerusalem Council was in 49, so it had to be written before then because he would already written this. And, and there's some controversy about who James is. But I will give you the the view that I have, and, and the Protestant movement differs from the Catholic Church on this, and, um, and half the Eastern Orthodox, if it matters, they're split on the issue, but I believe from the scriptures, without trying to explain them, James is the half-brother of Christ, the child of Joseph, following the virgin birth. Now, everybody's in agreement about the virgin birth, but there are some differences that come into play that um, some say, well, Mary couldn't have had other children because that would break her virginity, but that does not square with Scripture here, in my opinion. But it doesn't matter. In the, it, it does in one way because I think it takes on meaning when James is the half-brother of Christ and how he identifies himself. Um, but there are some Scriptures that point it out. Matthew 12, 46 to 50, this is the basis. I try to read the scripture and not get a whole lot of other uh, doctrines out there, but just check them out. While Jesus was still speaking to the crowds, his mother and brothers came and stood outside asking to speak to him. So it talks about his mother and brothers, and they say, well, the word brothers was used for other relatives. It was at times, however... They determined that these brothers may have been cousins or they may have been something else, just relatives. But there is a word in scripture for cousins and that's not used. And the apostles are not called brothers at all until much, much, much later. In fact, you won't find it. They're called apostles. They're called disciples. It's Paul that begins to write about brothers. Okay, so in the Gospels, Jesus is not calling them brothers, but if they said is his brother, mother and brothers are waiting to talk to you. And Jesus said, who are my mothers and brothers? But all of you. Then Matthew 13, and I, there's not time to look all these up. You can always ask me if you want to know. Matthew 13, 55 and 56. Listen to this. The Pharisees go, isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother named Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon and Judas? And they name them. And again, some say, well, that was, they were cousins, or, or Joseph had children before. But that's, that's not in Scripture, that's whatever, tradition. Okay. 
And then he says, and are not his sisters with us. So that really begins to mount, and it's plural. So at least six are being talked about. But there is another reason that the, in Scripture, from the Greek, that says James is very likely a half-brother of Jesus. That when the Holy Spirit comes to Mary and says, you will conceive and bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, and so on, she ends up saying, how shall this be since I have not or I do not know, using the word, a form of gnosko, which means experienced intimately a man. The word is used Old Testament and New for intimate physical relationships. She said, how can this be since I don't have any physical relationships? And, and the angel Gabriel says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you'll conceive and you will bring forth a son. Bear a son. Now that same word is used in Matthew 125 of, about Joseph. This, Mary said, I do not know a man. How is this going to happen? And then in Matthew 125 it says, and Joseph did not know, it means intimate physical relationship, did not know her until after Jesus was born. That's how the Greek looks. So, I, whether or not he was a half-brother, whether James was or wasn't isn't going to change our study one bit. How's that? So I'm just bringing up my position. But it won't change the truth of this book, even if he wasn't a relative. He was a skeptic. In fact, at one point it says, in John, in John chapter 7, verses 1 through 4, um, it ends up, and it says that the, the brothers of Jesus were going to go to the, again, not calling them apostles, were going to go to the festival, and they kind of mocked him and said, why don't you go up to the festival and show your stuff, man? No one does miracles in secret. If you want to really impress people, get up there and do it in front. And then verse 5 of that chapter tells why they were kind of needling Jesus. Why don't you go up and show off, man? And it says in verse 5 of John 7, because his own brothers did not yet believe in him. Now, when you hear that, that wouldn't mean his apostles. That wouldn't mean Christian brothers, because they would believe in him. So they're saying something there. Okay, so he was a skeptic. Now we're done with that. Everybody happy? All right. James, a devoted, okay. James, a devoted follower and leader. That's the second trait about James. He's devoted. Follower. 1 Corinthians 15, 7 says specifically, it names James. When it doesn't name the others, it names James as one to whom Jesus appeared after his resurrection. And then Acts chapter 1 and 2, Acts chapter 1 finds James in the upper room with the others, with Mary, and meeting. So James is one on which the Holy Spirit is poured out in that upper room experience. Then... Um, in Galatians 1.19, Paul is describing his call to be an apostle. Like, Paul, you can't be an apostle because you didn't walk with Christ, because that was kind of the definition then. But then Jesus appeared unto Paul and called him to be an apostle. Every church recognizes that, every denomination and so on. Okay. In describing that, Though this James was not an apostle, he had that kind of status, and in fact he led the church in Jerusalem. He was the bishop over Jerusalem until his death in A.D. 62, probably in A.D. 62. Anywhere from 62 to 69 from what I read. Now, so, um, James... Paul, when describing James, says, or his own apostleship, said, I went up there and I didn't see any of the apostles except James, the apostle. Or that's the way it would read. I didn't see, there were no apostles other than James. So it's kind of like he's viewing James as an apostle now. All right. 
I bring that up just to say James' status. James has really grown in leadership, in recognition of his spiritual character. So, he's a devoted follower and leader. Now, I'm going to read, if I find it here, um, yes, I'm going to read Acts 15. If, if you remember, the earliest big church fight that I can find is in Acts 15, okay? And guess what? It wasn't over music. <laughs> That's refreshing right in itself. <laughs> or carpet, not the color of the carpet. What's that duct tape on the carpet doing? Okay. Um, they were G Gentiles. Oh, that was my wife. Gentiles. Nice to have you here today. Gentiles were coming to Christ. But you see, God's chosen people through which the message would be delivered was the Jews, right? They were his people. From Abraham on, called and covenant with God. And so, but the Gentiles were becoming followers of this Jewish Messiah who had risen from the grave. So the Jews, many of the Jews were still practicing a lot of the law, okay? Uh, they didn't have to give that up. And whereas Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, talks about all the freedom because he's got a different audience pretty much, James is really keeping things, hey, you know, we're going to keep doing our Jewish traditions even as Christians. If they don't violate our belief in Christ, we're going to keep doing them. So he is about practicing the laws of Moses also. All right. So there becomes this big discussion, argument, to be honest, in some points it's saying they got face to face. And uh, just like Joy does to me when she disagrees with me. <laughs> and so they, and, and uh, <coughs> you don't, I guess, not really. Okay, and so they had this big argument. And after there was a discussion, James shows what a, what a peaceful, humble leader he is. And... <laughs> I love what he does. In Acts 15, verse 13, first of all, in the previous verses, they're all talking and they're trying to figure out, what are we going to do with these Gentiles? Hey, that's me, guys. What are we going to do with them? You know what's really scary is they got the Holy Spirit too. Now we got to deal with that. Because they thought it was all Jews gathered in the upper room and now the Holy Spirit is being poured out. But this was not new. And James knew that this was prophesied. I want you to know that God chose a people to bring the message through, but he brought the message for all. And the good news of that is I'm in and you're in, and whatever nation, tongue, or tribe, we're all in because of Jesus. He's no respecter of persons. And so they get there, and here's James. Oh, my. Okay, so here's James. He stands up and says, he waits till they stop speaking. James responds. He let them all finish. And you can just see this. He says, brothers, listen to me. Simeon has reported how God first intervened to take from the Gentiles of people for his name. And the words of the prophets agree with this as it is written. After these things I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. I will re rebuild its ruins and set it up again so that the rest of humanity may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, declares the Lord who makes these things happen known from long ago. Therefore, he says, in my judgment, folks, we should not cause difficulties for those among the Gentiles who turn to God. You know, James is, and then he just gives them a couple of rules. Abstain from sexual immorality. That's always the big one. And then also don't eat food that's been sacrificed to idols or strangled and blood. So he gives them like two or three rules, and then he says, of Jewish rules, and he says, let's not make it hard for them. Now, maybe there's one lesson here. We, You know, the Jews had added some 700 
laws or regulations so that it had really become cumbersome serving God. And in fact, the common people just didn't even know. There were so many rules and regulations that weren't of the heart. They were of you better. That sacrifice isn't good enough. You better get a new one. You know what I mean? That's why I want to say, let's kind of watch our judgment. Because religion, not relationship, religion can come to a place where it's, you're not measuring up. That's why I said we need to know the difference in immaturity an obligation to men's rules versus God. I love what the apostles said in the book of Acts when they were told, you need to shut up because you're going against our teaching. Okay, and they said, we must obey God rather than men. You guys need to be silent because, see, there is a difference in, in just religious rules and the doctrine often of Christ. So James was smart enough and wise enough, and he's the man that talks about wisdom, to say, you know what, wherever we can, now, we can't with cults and demonic doctrines. Wherever we can find commonality with brothers and sisters, let's find it. Those things we can agree on in Christ, let's do it. We've got, we've got probably a thousand denominations, and there's the fundamental <coughs> Baptist, and the Southern Baptist, and the and the General Baptist Conference, and the, and the Free Will Baptist, and the King James Baptist, and so there's all, just in death, just Baptist. And so there's that in, in other things too. And so it's like, wow, how are we going to figure this out? And I'm going to tell you it's this, it's what James used. It's the Word of God. And the Holy Spirit that He gives us. So, um, James, a great leader, Using scripture, reason, and their tradition. And by the way, there are at least four things that do figure in to evidence for you in your life. Number one is the Bible. That's number one. The scripture is your evidence. That's where you find all truth that God has designed to give us in these times by his Holy Spirit. The second one is your experience. That does make a difference. That's why sharing your experience with people. It does make a difference. And the experience we have. The third one is reason. What is reasonable? And the last one is tradition. And it should be. Because traditions change. In fact, Jesus said, you know what you're doing, guys? Here's what he said to the Pharisees. They were so proud because they had it right. I want you to know they got it right. They nailed it. And then Jesus walks up. No wonder they killed him. He walks up and says, you know what you're doing? You're exchanging the doctrines and traditions of men for the doctrine of God. So even though I'm in a church that has organizational structure and doctrines, and I thank God, and that's good, Let's bear in mind, sometimes there are non-essential things to salvation that my brother over here might not agree with, but he's my brother. I have brought this up. I'm not going to get very far today, am I? Wesley. I got three pages and I'm on the first part of page one. Um, that's okay because we have an hour, we have an hour and a half. Okay. Uh, Wesley. And John Calvin, two different theologians, disagreed. And I, I used to love reading their letters. Isn't it nice if you could disagree agreeably? Wouldn't that be nice in this day and age? If people didn't have to be angry and hateful in their opinions? That you could literally have a discussion? And so you could come to say, and you can't have a discussion anymore. Um, and it goes both ways. It doesn't matter. It's Democrats, Republicans, liberals, conservatives. I mean, there's just anger everywhere. And there's no discussion. And everybody finally says, I think I'll just turn it off. 
But John Wesley and Calvin sharply disagreed on some things. And they wrote letters to each other. And there would be sharp disagreement. But you could just feel the respect they had for one another. And then and one day, one lady knew that, um, that uh, this, it was Whitfield, actually, George Whitfield, that they wrote the letters with, not Calvin. And, and one lady knew that Whitfield was very opposed to Wesley's, some of his doctrine. And so she went up to George Whitfield, a great teacher and evangelist, and she went, he was a great evangelist. And she went up to him and she said, you know, I so agree with you over John Wesley. In fact, I wonder if John Wesley will even be in heaven. See what I mean? Well, then, no, excuse me. That isn't the way she worded it. She says, I wonder if we'll even see him in heaven. And George Whitfield, she's expecting George Whitfield to say, yeah, me too. George Whitfield says, I'm not sure I will. But he said, the reason is, I believe he may be so close to the throne. And maybe I won't be that close. It's called humility, folks. They loved each other. And in the end, they, ca they called themselves brothers. And he said, John Wesley said, we disagree on a lot, but George, is your heart right with God? as my heart is right with God? If so, give me your hand. James was about extending the hand of fellowship. Okay. Finally, I guess that's all we'll do today. Ooh, I have so much more. <laughs> it really is hard. It's so hard. James the prayer warrior and martyr. This maybe is a good place to end. Maybe it is. He was called James the Just. And one of the reasons is 25% of his book is written about the rich oppressing the poor. Or about the proud using the weaker. 25% of it. A quarter of his book is on that. He was a, he was a radical advocate where social injustice was taking place. And don't get scared. Oh, is he going to talk about social justice? God is about justice. It's all throughout the Old Testament. Pure religion undefiled is to visit the widows and the orphans in their affliction and remain unspotted from the world. He is about justice for the oppressed. But Jesus said, I came not to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the... Or to set at liberty them that are bruised. That's what I mean. But it really isn't social justice. It's just plain Christianity. It's spiritual justice. It's God's justice. And so, James. He was called James the Just. But he had another name by tradition. In fact, um, Agesippus, the second century Christian, wrote about him. He was called Old Camel Knees. What a nickname. Boy, that's what I want to be remembered for. Oh, here comes Old Camel Knees. You know why he was called that? Please tell me. He was on his knees so much in prayer. They said he would go to the temple alone and pray and pray and pray. And his knees became hard and out of shape. From all the time that he spent in prayer, listening to begging God to forgive the nation. Begging God to forgive the Jews for the shape they were in. Couldn't we use some old camel knees in this day and age? 
people of prayer, saints of prayer, people devoted to prayer. What are the things that I'm camel knees for? How do you do that? What would my knees get hard for? What are the desires of my heart? What is it that I would go to the temple, even in my living room, and cry out to God for? Is it about my finances? Is it about my home? Is it about a better position on my job? Is it about me, or is it about... Oh God, forgive us as a people. Forgive us for the way we live. Forgive us for giving you if, if we're really good, saying love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then give them 5% of your time if Netflix isn't fresh. 10% of your time would be 2.4 hours a day. No, this is not a condemning message I am saying. What is it? What's the priority? What do I cry out for? Is it about me or, or is it that I am desperate to see a world come to Jesus Christ and know what I know and feel what I feel and have the hope that I have? You all know the scripture. You know it. If my people called by my name. James is a book of humility. Humble yourselves. If my people called by my name. Called Christians. James isn't about just being called one. He's about expressing, presenting that in your life. Called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sins and heal the land. So let me just try to close with this. Well, let me read just some things from the book, just very quick, just oversight. Just some highlights. I just put them in, you know, one of those yellow highlighters. I just put it in highlights from the book of James. Consider it great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials We'll come back to that. That's going to be a couple of weeks on that verse, I think. Okay? I mean, because obviously... What? Do you know what the great joy is here? It's like a jumping up and down. Seriously? It's like... It's... it's, it's what? Oh, yes, I'm having trouble. woo <laughs> So we need to find out what he means, don't we? And we'll come to that. Because he doesn't water it down. He keeps it going. Then he says, let the brother of humble circumstances boast. Let him be the one that's raised up in exaltation. But the rich, he will pass away in humiliation like a flower of the field. We had in Florida what we call the Florida lawn. You know what a Florida lawn is? It isn't. Um, unless you really can afford a lot of watering, unless you really have underground sprinklers, it's like, it's brown, and you might as well put rocks over it. I mean, lawns die really quick there, and I watched our neighbors put in brand new saw. <laughs> it was great. And I was so jealous for about a month. <laughs> and then it's like nice dry. Well, I didn't say that to him. I just thought, oh, man, and i got to tell you, because if you're going to leave this lawn for more than a month and go somewhere else, forget it. It's gone. James says that's the way riches are. And then he, and then he ends up saying, 
Every good and perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of lights who does not change like shifting. Here's what he's saying. God is steadfast and God is good. Don't you think that's news that people need to hear? God is good and God is steadfast. He doesn't shift around. Do you realize how many things are shifting today? All the things that were supposedly true before, it's all being changed. Everybody's trying to bend this to fit the culture. I'm not bending this, guys. No, not bending this. This is what I stand on. And then he says, don't show favoritism. Oh, then there's this one. In the same way, faith, if it does not have works or expression or response, is dead. Then listen to this. With the tongue, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people. Woo! Watch Facebook. He says, not Christianity. You cannot curse someone that he may. You may not like them. You may not like their politics, but you can't curse them. Tough message? No, biblical. Let me just give you the verse. With the tongue we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in God's likeness. How many people are made in God's likeness and would you tell me who's not? <coughs> so if you don't like Trump, you better pray for him. And if you don't like Biden, you better pray for him. Do you hear me? Mm -hmm. You know what you might even have to do? Oh, God forbid you'd have to do this. You might even have to pray a blessing over them that would change their lives. Not a blessing over their politics, not a blessing over what they believe, not over something that's sinful or evil. That's not what I'm saying. But I wonder if I would lay awake one night praying for the people that I don't like. Bless those who persecute you. Pray for those who despitefully use you. Anybody feeling used in this time? I am. I don't like the control that they're putting on me or want to. I don't like it. Am I praying? Oh man, is this book going to be tough? Woo! It's going to be hard. It's going to be hard. Don't have selfish am ambition in your heart. Then he talks about wisdom from hell, which seems like an oxymoron. Wisdom from hell? But he does. He talks about wisdom that comes from hell and wisdom that doesn't. Then he talks about our passions that cause war and they rage within us. And then he talks about one that Joy and I read quite a bit. The brevity of life. Don't say today we'll do this and tomorrow we'll do that and I will we'll make all these plans and he says you do not know what tomorrow will bring to me. No. He says you don't know what tomorrow will bring what your life will be for you're like a vapor that appears for a little while. We're just a wisp, hun. Yep. In the scheme of eternity, we're just a little steam. Well, I'm a lot of steam. You're a little steam. <laughs> Passing through. And I can tell you, I've prayed and I've had friends that have had all kinds of diseases, diseases and Frank that passed away from cancer. And I thought, about, but when you hear it yourself in your family, when you hear it, and you go, how is life going to change? And let me tell you, I want to live in those, I want to live now like I do in those moments. I don't want to say, now we really have to start depending on God. Hey, you're dependent right now for every breath. Yeah. Right now. Well, my finances are awful. I'm going to really depend on God. He'll fix them. You need to depend them on when they're great. Because you can't even get out of bed in the morning without the grace of God. 
James is really something. I think he's going to change my life. That the Holy Spirit is going to do something through James that is going to absolutely revolutionize my thinking. He said, you don't know what your life will be. It's a vapor. Can I give you the first message out of that? Get right with God. You don't know about tomorrow. Tomorrow I'll get right. Tomorrow I'll make it. No, you don't have tomorrow. And then finally he says, Oh, I love this. In the end, the last chapter, he says, Is anyone among you suffering? He should pray. Is anyone cheerful? Saying, Is anyone among you sick? Call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. But listen to this. I love the last part. My brothers and sisters, if any among you strays from the truth and someone turns him back, let that person know. So I'm going to let you know another day. That whoever turns a sinner from the air of his way will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. What is he saying there? Here's what he's saying. You see somebody in trouble, don't be silent. You see somebody whose spiritual life is in trouble. But I don't want to judge. This isn't about that. This is about saving. You see somebody, you point out the error of his ways and you say, Come on home. Come on back. I got a lot of people that we're praying that for right now. Like I said, ministers' homes that are breaking up. Ministers' homes. Close family homes are. Come on back. And the person that does that will cover a multitude of sin. See, because here's the final message His message is mercy. Mercy. Blessed are the merciful. Because you know what happens to the merciful? They get mercy, right, Chris? They get mercy. If you want mercy in your life, you need to give mercy. And that's what James is closing with. With all this doing, he's saying, let me wrap it up with this. Have the heart of Christ for people. He will bless you for that. Father,